This portion is financing stormwater and green infrastructure solutions. And we're going to start this off with a discussion about sustainable rate structure with our own Sheena Tanakawa from the Soil and Water Conservation District. So take it away, Sheena. Great. Thank you so much, Holly. Welcome back, everyone. I'm so glad to see that more than 50 people are still with us. Um, I'm going to start my presentation and hopefully it all works. Can you see the screen? Excellent. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about how the current water rate structure is, but with a caveat that I am not an expert. I know what I know by having done my own research and having talked to people, but I am not a DEP person who is um, immersed in this. So I'm going to do a very elementary foundational presentation on how we pay for water and water rate restructuring for equity. So, and it's the slide advancing. I hope it's working. If not, you'll stop me. All right. Um, good. good. Stormwater infrastructure, why, what it is and why it's important. This is gonna be a really quick review for many of you. Combined, so we have two separate systems as Melissa and Pinar both talked about. So I'm gonna do a quick run through of the review here. Combined sewer system, there is one set of pipes carrying both the stormwater from wet weather events as well as the sewage and wastewater from the buildings. We are discharging annual on the annual average 20 billion gallons of this combined sewer overflow. That's a mixture of sewage and rainwater. That's we did we did a calculation once. I think this was Sean Dixon's calculation. Volume-wise, it's about 70 Empire State buildings. That's how much is going in there. Now, with the CSO control, long-term control plans underway the volume will be reducing over time. But it's still a significant amount of mixture of sewage and rainwater going into our waterways untreated every time it rains. So very basic, you can imagine this, it's wastewater and stormwater, that's the combined sewer overflow. And that is what it looks like. Um, I believe this is Guanas, possibly Newtown Creek. And there's actually a video of Guanas um, overflow. It's called Punami that you can look up in YouTube. And this is what the area of the combined sewer overflow looks like, the catchment areas. And it's a map that you can actually access. I will share this link with the uh, follow-up items. You can look at the CSO catchment areas and overlay it on your city council member district which might come in handy when we start talking about intro 1618 that Mike was talking about. This is a great tool that was developed by Riverkeeper. Then we have the separate storm sewer system, which Melissa also talked about, and that's the area where the sewage treatment pipes just carry the sewage and wastewater, and there is a separate set of pipes that discharge stormwater. Now that's not really great either because if you think about what's on the surface of our streets and rooftops, we've got sediments, we have litter, leaf litter, whatnot. Um, we have a lot of bacteria on the surface of the streets, especially when we have rats and pigeons running amok on our streets and irresponsible pet owners. We also have fossil fuel combustion byproducts. Those are um, gases that actually do come down with the raindrops and come down onto the street surface. Not to mention there are spills and other stuff that ends up on a street surface, which means every time it rains, all that stuff on the surface of our impervious surfaces in the city, whether it's roofs or parking lots or street surface, that gets washed away into the separate sewer system, causing polluted runoff. So if you visualize it, it's the rain or snow melt. It's actually snow that we had last week is melting away. It's probably running off, catching all the animal waste and combustion products and other stuff on the surface and discharging into our waterways untreated. So separate storm sewer is not great either, which is why we have to manage it. 
And that's just a picture to remind you this might be happening right now as we see our snow melting. And that is the number of outfalls we have in this city. We have a lot of separate um, storm sewer outfalls as well as CSO outfalls. Our waterfront is just dotted with these outfalls, whether it's combined or separate. So how do we address water pollution? Again, this is just a review of what you heard earlier. Gray infrastructure is the civil engineering solutions. We have the Newtown Creek Wastewater F Treatment Facility. I can't even keep track of what we call these things anymore. It's wastewater treatment plants, but I think it's water, wastewater resource reclamation center or something or other. The name keeps changing. Essentially, these are the facilities that treat your sewage and disinfects it and takes solids out and treats it for biological stuff and discharges it, disinfected into our waterways. That's how wastewater treatment system generally works. And then we have these um, outfalls at the water's edge. We all, this is part of a wastewater facility, facility treatment facilities up here on the right, upper right. And some of the sewer pipes are gigantic. You can see this person here in this, can't remember which pipe this is, but it is an incredible civil engineering um, structure that we have in the city treating 1.2 billion gallons of wastewater every day, I believe. It's a huge amount of wastewater that the city is charged with treating. And then we have greenish infrastructure. It's the nature-based solutions in treating the rainwater. So the, the whole point is to direct the rainwater away from the storm, sewage and the stormwater systems and absorb it into the ground. Many of us consider forests and wetlands as part of the green infrastructure portfolio. Many people don't consider them or they don't think about them, but for us SWIM coalition advocates, we definitely consider forestry and wetlands, whether it's restoring wetlands or creating new wetlands, they are in the portfolio of green infrastructure. On the upper right is one of my favorite green roofs. It's the Kingsland, Kingsland Wildflower Green Roof on uh, right next to the Newtown Creek Wastewater Treatment Plant, and this, it's the home of the Newtown Creek Alliance. It's a beautiful roof. So these are the portfolios that we have. So how do we fund this? Well, public infrastructure can be funded through federal money, which up until now, we have very little federal infrastructure money coming. But with the um, new infrastructure funding about to come down from the federal, federal government, we will see an infusion of federal monies for these infrastructure improvements. But historically speaking, federal government has not been putting a lot of money into infrastructure, or water infrastructure. The state will be also putting money into this. We have um, Environmental Protection Fund that puts money into this, and there are a variety of other sources of funding from the state for water infrastructure. But the city really is the main funding source for much of the water infrastructure. Green infrastructure funding is also the same. There are state grants available for private properties as well as public properties for green infrastructure. And for private properties, there are city grants programs that Melissa talked about. There's the GI grants for green roofs, as well as the new large property grants for uh, 50,000 square feet or larger green infrastructure properties, green infrastructure program. There's also private funding, meaning property owners can put their own money into creating green infrastructure on their private property. So let's talk about how the city generates its revenue for. In water infrastructure and why it's not equitable at the moment. So these are the key players in this water arena in New York City. We have the New York City Water Board that sets the rate. That means how, they are the board that decides how much we pay for our water. There's the finance, uh, New York City Municipal Water Finance Authority, which is the one I think that does the financing of infrastructure. This is the arena of business people, so I don't fully understand. But there is the New York City DEP, which is the entity that we're most familiar with. But it's not just DEP doing everything. There are two other entities involved in this whole financing of infrastructure and implementing infrastructure. 
So everybody already pays for water. Whether you've seen the water bill or not, you are paying for it one way or another. Um, I am the treasurer of my co-op. And I'm, until I took over as the treasurer of co-op four years ago, I had never seen the water bill in my entire life. And I've lived in New York City since 1982. If you're renting an apartment, you don't ever see a water bill unless you have an arrangement with your landlord that you pay for your water separately. Most renters do not see the water bill because it's part of your rent payments. Many people who live in condos and condominiums also don't see the water bill because it's the co-op or the condo management that pays the bill. Individual condos and co-op owners don't usually pay for water separately. So it's very possible that you're paying for water, but you don't really understand what you're paying for, which is why I'm going to give you a really quick overview of how the rate is structured right now. So your water bill funds three water management needs. One is drinking water. And I have to put a plug in here. New York City has the best drinking water, hands down. Not that I've been to every single country in the world, but I have traveled in different parts of the world and also different parts in the, in the country at least. And we have the best drinking water. So we have to be proud of that, but that costs money. And we have to pay for wastewater, that's sewage management. It's all your wastewater from the toilets and the bathrooms and dishwashers and laundry and all that needs to be treated. And then there's the third component, which is the stormwater. So that's what DEP needs to manage and pay for. How the sewer rate is calculated right now is the DEP tells you how much potable water you used and it's through the metering system. So each building is metered. Most of the buildings right now is metered and it tells you how much water the building uses. So you have this base of potable water usage and that's what you get billed for. For the um, wastewater and stormwater, it's lumped together and it's 159% 100, of potable water usage. That sewer charge covers both the sewage and the stormwater. So the bill is your potable water use plus sewer and stormwater. That's 159% of your potable water. And that's your water bill. Okay, that's a pretty simple formula that everybody can actually understand. Except if you think about the property types for these rate payers, we have an in inequitable system, and I will walk you through that. Let's say you have a large impervious surface retail, or it could be a private, um, private residence, but it's un unusual to have a, a huge rooftop and a big parking lot like this. It's usually a big box retail operation that have this type of land use on the left. Big box development, big box retail. You have huge roofs with a 300 car parking lot that's all paved over. And what you're seeing is you have a, sorry, um, this kind of retail usually has just bathrooms for employees and customers, maybe two or three bathrooms. That means the water use is not all that big. Um, so you're paying for your potable water plus 159% for combined sewer and stormwater for a property like this. That's the little conceptual graph on the bottom left. Let's move over to a residential building, a small brownstone, let's say, with three family units. You have a smaller footprint. Each of these rectangles is a building that's uh, metered for water usage. But in this small building, you have maybe three or four families with two bathrooms in each family, dishwasher, laundry, showers, whatnot. So the water usage for this property might be quite big because you have a lot of people living there using that water. So you have a higher water usage and then you have 159% of that water usage for both sewage and stormwater. But if you think about 
properties that generate stormwater. Which of the two properties generate more stormwater? Clearly the one on the left with a flat, big flat roof and a big parking lot that's all impervious. This big box retail operation generates a lot of stormwater runoff every time it rains. Compared to this small residential building with a small rooftop and it could have a planted backyard that's not impervious, that's a pervious backyard where the rainwater can infiltrate into the ground. It may even have a front yard that is planted that allows infiltration into the ground. So this, these properties, the so small brownstones or residentials may not be generating a lot of stormwater, but you're still paying 159%. So you're actually paying for stormwater management as a small property owner, you may be paying for the stormwater management of this type of big box res, um, commercial operation that generates a lot of stormwater. To us, this is an in inequitable way of charging for water. So what we want to see happen is why not separate out that 159% that's combined um, sewage and stormwater management fee into two separate components, separate it out to sewage charge and stormwater charge, right? And then there's the water use and then the, the, the bill. That would be how we want to see happen. Right now, this 159% covers both of them. So what we want to see happen then is there is the sewage charge, there is the stormwater charge, and there is water use, three separate components. Everything is still based on, well, not everything. The sewage charge can still be based on water use. It may be 100% of the water use would be the sewage charge because what goes in goes out. But the stormwater charge can be a separate charge based on the amount of impervious surface on your property. And that could become the new rate structure and the new water bill that is more equitable. So just quickly, and I can't remember how long I have. I think I have two more minutes. So I'm going to just be really quick about it. So that's one area where we are advocating for this se separate stormwater charge. And the DEP is actually convening a water rate structure advisory group, which SWIM members serve on. And we are starting to look at doing something like this. And DEP is also conducting a comprehensive analysis of the water rate structure in a more holistic way to make sure that the DEP can generate the revenue necessary to do what their mandate is. That's ensuring clean drinking water and managing the, the sewage and managing stormwater. So DEP is definitely engaged in this process of looking at the rate structure and also making sure that the rate does not become too expensive. So affordability is a big part of that study as well. So for anything we do, we need both regulations and incentives. So in the last minute, I'm just gonna give you a quick overview of some of the regulations. So local law 9294 is a green roof requirement, which Dustin is going to cover in the next section. So I'm not going to go into. And also unified stormwater rule is definitely a regulation. It's going to require new development to adhere to certain limits in how much stormwater they can produce. So those are actually really good regulations that we advocated for. And I'm happy to see them come to reality. Incentives, we have the green roof tax abatement, which is the topic of next presentation. We also have the green roof grants, which is a great program. If you can access that, I would definitely encourage it. And there's also the large property green infrastructure grants that just rolled out. So these are incentives that we have that exist. We can probably come up with more that we should really think about. So maybe that's a topic in the breakout session later today. So that was my quick tour of the water rate structure as we, we have it today.